everyone. Welcome to today's episode on Metamorphosis with Toby. And yes, it is our first episode here on the L series. And we're glad to be here. Interestingly, we have our very, very first guest on this series. On this series today is uh, Dr. Adiola Abujola, and he is a resident physician. Thank you so much, Dr. Adiola. All right. So um, thank you so much for, for answering this call. We really do appreciate it. And so uh, before we really dive into all we want to talk about today, um, there's a reason we want to do this. And in my findings, I did see that uh, according to the Association of Cancer Society in the US, it was estimated that about 40, over 14,000 women will be diagnosed with invasive cancer this year, and over 600,000 women globally uh, had cervical cancer in 2020. And so it seems that this is something that um, has been on the rise, as something that is worth talking about, especially for some of us who do not really know or started getting to know later or a little later in life. So we just want you to talk to us about what um, cervical cancer is, the symptoms, how, how, how we can be diagn uh, diagnosed, um, treated, and everything just around cervical cancer. And so if you're just tuning in, this is Metamorphosis with Toby. And again, we have Dr. Adiola with us to talk to us about cervical cancer. If you haven't subscribed, kindly subscribe, uh, click the subscribe button, like, share. And so on to you, Dr. Adiola. Oh, yeah. So, um, thank you, ahead. Toby. Uh, thanks for uh, you know inviting me to your show. Um, I'll make it a uh, brief and um, very concise. I won't bore us with statistics, but yeah, like you rightly said, um, cervical cancer is one of the leading causes of cancer death um, in women globally and in the U.S. Um, actually, in developed world, um, of which U.S. is one of them, it is the leading, um, uh, it is the third um, um, leading cause of cancer diagnosis um, in the U.S. and the third leading cause of um, gynecological cancer deaths in the U.S. While you know in the developing world, it's like the second cause of most diagnosed um, cancer in women. Mm -hmm. Um. So yeah. So like every other cancers, it's just um, an abnormal. Um, uncontrolled um, proliferation or growth of cells that um, because um, they become uh, unresponsive to normal regulatory mechanism, they tend to overgrow and become that mass that we call tumors. Um, and um, for the specifics of what we are talking about today, we are talking about the malignant kind of um, tumors, not the benign one. Um, so um, the cervical um, neoplasm um, that we are discussing today. So um, to that's just a brief, uh, you know, overview about cervical cancer generally. Um, so I would go into the briefly about the types uh, types of cervical cancer, okay. and I would touch bases on some epidemiological points. Okay. and the risk factors, uh, then uh, maybe the second section can involve um, management. Okay. Um, so, so like I said, so cervical cancer, um, we have um, two types usually. We have the um, squamous, um, 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 squamous cancer and we have the adenocarcinomas. So the squamous ones actually uh, constitute about 70% of the cervical cancers and the adenocarcinomas, about 25%. Um, <laughs> yeah, and um, usually um, this um, happens, we are talking about women specifically here, and um, um, epidemiology-wise, um, it's um, the median age of diagnosis, really, especially in the US, um, it's about 50 years. 
uh, of, although people can have it before that, especially immunocompromised uh, people. Um, yeah, I was, I was, I was going to ask about that the, the yeah. age because yeah. I, yeah, I, th I think that some most times, because as women or younger adults, sometimes we think that when we hear the cervical cancer or so cancers and all, we we tend to want to think that maybe it's in older people. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's it's good to uh, to break that myth, um, because most cancers they start um, as uh, you know they start gradually. Uh, it's it's slowly infiltrating um, to more. So like cervical cancer, it's it's we have phases. We have the cervical like intra um, epithelial neoplasia, so which has like three stages, like one, two, three. And those are the things we test for. Actually, we want to, when they talk about um, cervical cancer screening, the aim of um, screening, actually for all screenings, you want to, you do screenings for those ailments that can be, uh, that can be readily diagnosed via the screening tool and that have um, amenable, you know, um, procedures to treat it. True. You wouldn't want to do a screening for something, even if you detect it, there's nothing you do about it. So usually when we do those screenings, we can pick up the early, uh, gradually, you know, infiltrating phase that has not yet uh, become invasive or gotten into the bloodstream that can, you know, spread around. So um, that is, um, so when we do screenings, actually, we want to detect those early phase that we can readily treat before they get into the full-blown um, cancerous lesion. So taking it from where I stopped before, you know, um, talking about that, um, I think I was talking about the H, right? So and yeah. like you rightly said, um, we don't have to say it's a disease of the old. It starts from even the young. So um, and uh, stemming from that, I can now talk about the clinical, um, the signs and symptoms that we readily comes with cervical cancer. Mm -hmm. um, so usually um, you see um, abnormal vaginal bleeding. Um, so by abnormal vaginal bleeding, there are different forms, but more unique for cervical cancer is like the postcoital bleeding. Um, like after having, um, you know, after some um, intercourse, you can see persistent bleeding from the um, vagina, which is not normal. Um, also, for those that are postmenopausal, okay. um, they are not supposed to be bleeding anyhow. There can be so when you are saying postmenopausal bleeding, um, that is very homeous. So you have to look for, you know, um, rule out um, cervical cancer. Um, also, you could uh, it could present with mass lesion. You could see something protruding out of the cervix. So although it could be polyps, there are other dif uh, differentials of something protruding from the cervix, but mm -hmm. um, surely um, cervical cancer should be top on our list and uh, uh, to rule out. Um, mm -hmm. Some women just present with um, abnormal discharge, like vaginal discharge. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, um, some people present with pelvic pain, um, you know, honest split pain, you know, persistent even despite different... Um, um, therapeutic approaches, the pain um, refused to, you know, to disappear. Um, some people might even present with sim symptoms of um, surrounding um, structures, like the urinary structure, because it's just anterior to the cervix, or mm. the rectus, rectum, which is just posterior to it. So they might have problem with their bowel movement, uh, you know, alternating diarrhea and constipation. They might have problems with uh, um, the um, urinary tracts with um, um, recurrent UTIs as well. Um, so those, but those are not major presentations. Um, so those are the common presentations for um, um, cervical cancer. Okay. I, to... I, yeah. So so sorry to to cut you short. I, I was going to ask about how about people who do not have symptoms, like any of this that you mentioned. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So you. So when we get to the screening, so we we'll talk more about that. So of course, there's it's there's no point calling it screening if people already have symptoms. So this aim of screening is actually to test the non-symptomatic population. Once oh. you have symptoms, it's a diagnostic approach. So you are doing diagnostic workup 
to to know what is happening that's no longer okay. screening okay so um we do we'll get to that right so the next thing um, just to be more systematic about it is um we just discuss the risk factors now right of oh, signs and symptoms so the risk yeah. factors now so um, so risk factors so usually um um of course um you have to be a, a woman that has cervix if you don't have cervix um you <laughs> You are, you are free from um, this um, uh, yeah. cancer, <laughs> um, but you need you need cervix to have it. So um, yeah. topmost uh, in the risk factor actually are you know um, early exposure, early um, onset of sexual um, intercourse in females um, or multiple sexual partners, uh, multiple sexual partners, or having a partner that has multiple sexual partners um so and where do all these things come uh, they all come from the fact that these exposures uh, put you at high risk of acquiring what we call um hpv human papilloma virus mm -hmm. so human papilloma virus is actually the main culprit for this cancer and um, you acquire them um, through um sex um, sexual intercourse. Actually, there was a point when they said um, human papilloma virus is the most commonly transmitted, uh, sexually transmitted um, infection, like infection, virus. Um, and not STI or trans. So, so yeah, so, but yeah, HPV, it's so prevalent, but the thing is, um, not to deviate from our discourse too much, okay. the thing is that HPV that is the main culprit in cervical cancer, as uh, many serotypes. Oh. And it is only certain serotypes that cause cervical cancer, um, specifically 16 and 18. We have others that cause um, warts. We call, they call them um, um, warts, genital warts, or okay. in, in medical term, uh, condylomata, condylomata accumulata. So, 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 um, so yeah. So HPVs, and that is how they um, they they propagate it. So maybe um, before I move forward, since we are talking about the risk factors, I can um, talk more about this HPV and um, what happens with it. So like I said, HPV, have, uh, we have the oncogenic strain, the strain that causes cancer, which is the 16 okay. and the 18. Um, so if you have, um, and some other ones, but 16 and 18 are the most popular ones. So those are some other ones like, um, like I think the 6, 11, they cause plantar, like what on the skin and stuff, or some other genital what. And those ones have different line of treatment. Okay, but for the oncogenic strain, the 16, 18, and the likes that cause cervical cancer, um, the treatment is different. And this is how it starts. Once you are infected with those uh, with the virus, it doesn't just uh, bloom into full bloom cervical cancer like that. It oh. starts by causing certain changes in the epithelium of the cervix. Okay, so and those changes. Uh, have been studied um, and shown to proceed in stages that they call um, cervical intrapetilia neoplasia stage one, um, stage two, stage three, um, or some, um, some features of undetermined significance. But they do this when they look at it under microscope to see those stages. And these are the things that we want to pick up with um, testing with screening. So when they screen, it's either you are totally free of those cytologic changes that I just described now, mm -hmm. or you have them. So if you have higher grade of those, like if you have um, CIN one or two, um, they might not think too much of it, but above two, they might want to proceed and do uh, like a biopsy, um, where they, like it's like a punch biopsy to, to to, to, to take the tissue out and further exploit to characterize the cells. Um, but that is how the, they usually proceed. Um, so um, leaving that, uh, so I discuss the risk factors. I think we can now talk about, just tell me if I'm missing, if there's some point you want me to talk about that I'm not talking about. Oh, so oh no. Let's talk about the testing. 
Yes. So let's talk about the screening. So the screening. So um, like like we said, um, the aim of screen because um, cervical cancer is one of the leading causes of uh, morbidity and mortality in women. It is mm -hmm. very imperative to actually find ways to preventing it because it's preventable. There are preventive measures, right? So mm -hmm. um. Uh, and in addition to those preventive measures, we we have screening in place for early detection and treatment. So, so um, uh, so the screening. So usually uh, we have um, different um, bodies like the American Cancer Society and the USP FTS. They have different guidelines, um, but um, generally um, for of sexually active women, um, we uh, or even if not sexually active, we don't start until twenty one. The twenty one is uh, is the cut like you start twenty one and above. Mm -hmm. And the reason they don't do it below twenty one, even though if you are sexually active, having multiple sexual partners, and you are at risk, um, studies have shown that are those adolescent um, period that even though you, you are at high risk of getting these HPVs, they found out that they self-resolve. Oh. Yeah. So they self-resolve and don't necessarily continue on that cascade that leads to uh, you know, higher grade lesions and cancer. And um, they realized that testing and discovering these, which naturally we know we are going to see, just causes some unnecessary psychological tension and mm -hmm. um, unnecessary waste of resources, okay. right? Mm -hmm. So sure. that is why they said, okay, from 21. So um, so um, for 21, we start and there are two different, so there are different types of, of screening tests. Mm -hmm. We have the cytologic test, which is the pap smear. Um, so the pap smear um, is a site, so it's what I do. So when I was telling you about the grades the other time, like cervical and tripetilia and neoplasia, yeah. what they use for the um so um and the uh, and the squamous we have squamous and tripetilia and neoplasia as well. You know I told you there are two types, yes. like adenoca and and then, yeah. So depending on yeah, so you can have CIN for the adenocarcinomatous lesions or the SI um uh, for the um for the other one. So um so when we do um the screening, what are okay, the cytologic screening. So you do pap smear, they look at it under microscope to look at the stages. So okay. you start at 21, and the, the thing is from 21 to 29, um, you do it every three, like every three years. That's the recommendation, like every three years from 21 to 29, and um from 30 above. From 30 above, you can you continue at that as well every three years up until 65. At that time, most depending on the disc, um on the your PCP or primary care provider, um, and based on your prior results and um, your risk factors, they may decide not to do it again, but okay. from 65 onward. So if you've had um negative results in the past 10 years or stuff like or very low grade lesions or stuff they may not continue that's for the cytology um okay. there's another screening which is the hpv testing so it's a hpv dna analysis so um for this um the american cancer society particularly favors this um and um i would maybe i'll make uh, make mention of it later and it's because with the advent of HPV vaccination, they because of you know the interaction of vaccination and some of those features you might see inside when you do cytology, they prefer DNA testing because a lot like um like I mean like two years ago like about seventy at least seventy percent of adolescents um in the US have had at least one HPV vaccination. So that's a, like a justification for them, you know, um, um, you know, leaning more towards HPV testing. So for yeah, HPV I, testing. Yeah, can I can I can I ask you a question? 
yeah. regarding this HPV vaccination. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I, I'm really glad. There. Okay, good. So okay. just after this, we'll go to prevention and... Um, okay. okay, so um, where did I stop? Um, yeah, so you we're talking about the second type of screening. You okay, yeah, so that. HPV testing. Yeah, so you should, that one can start, uh, according to the American Cancer Society, they, they say you can start about uh, 25 and you do it every five years if it is HPV testing, right? You do it every five years to just um, identify the HPV or if it is uh, HPV strain or um, serotype, if it is oncologic or not oncologic. And um, based on the results, there are other tests to do, right? Um, and there's the third one, which is co-testing. So co-testing is you do both the cytology and HPV um, DNA testing. And that one is also five yearly. So it's just the pap smear that is every three years. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, so, and yeah, like I said, at some, like usually at 65, um, most of clinicians would, you know, may decide not to, and um, based on some factors and prior results of issue. previous testing, mm -hmm. so not to continue um, again. And also based on maybe, um, the long longevity, maybe you have, uh, if they feel you have many more years to go on to <laughs> live, okay, maybe let's do it more. If they think okay. you are like, you are likely to die very soon, maybe based soon. on some other um, comorbidities, they may even stop before 65. So all those things are not like, you know, you know, um, clear of um, like, uh set in stone like that. It's, mm -hmm. you know, it, it has, there has to be a discussion with a, care provider and all with the patient. So those are mm -hmm. the um, testing, those are the screening. So when you do screening, you can have um, the different results from screening, like uh, they, it may just be totally negative, like uh, there's nothing to suggest uh, any, um, like um, maybe CIN or squamous intrapetelial neoplasia or you do HPV testing, nothing was detected, or they didn't see any oncogenic um, serotype, maybe they just saw some benign um, serotypes, so different things. But if they found higher grade, higher grade lesion, so, so that takes it, so that leads to another step in the flow chart. Because if it is higher grade, then you want to like, really characterize what's going on. Is it something you just, cause there are therapies that there are, um, there are things you can do to just nip it at that stage and not allow it to proceed. So they do corposcopy. So corposcopy is like a, like a microscopic, they just, you know, like, you know, they will look at the cervix, you know, with something like a microscope that enlarges um, the um, the cervical area. Okay. They'll, they'll put some solution and stuff, and based on the um, um, coloration of, based on the colors they see and some other things, they can say, oh, um, this is um, um, a high grade lesion. They can think based on what they see at that point, they can do a punch biopsy or colonization just to remove some tissues for further testing. And based on the result of that, um, you know, they would advise on the appropriate therapy, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so I'll just talk about on that for screening. Um, so if you have more questions on that, you can always ask later. Mm -hmm. Um, so, um, so in addition to screening, of course, yeah, we know there are screeners, but we don't want to put all our eggs in the screening basket. Mm -hmm. We also want to be very proactive with um, vaccination. Yeah. And there has been um, this um, overwhelming, like um, a huge uh, propaganda for vaccination in the past decade for HPV. Um, and it is even more so in the developed world in the US because um, I didn't hear much about that in, um, before coming here. So, mm -hmm. so, so uh, yeah, I was, I was, there. so that, that was, that was where I was going to go because, yeah, um, I'm, I, I I would personally think that maybe because I'm not in the med medical line or anything, because in Nigeria, I never heard anything about HPV vaccine until I got to the US and someone started talking about HPV. And I'm like, okay. So it means that there will be so many people 
that might be watching also right now that are probably not in the US, in Nigeria. So that's why I would really, I really like that we brought up the HPV because so many of us are not aware of what the HPV vaccine is or what it does. Oh yeah, so yeah, you're right. Um, um, I won't say um, I'm the only one that's not aware of this. I think there wasn't there wasn't so much um, noise about HPV vaccination when I was still training in Nigeria. Okay. Um, and you know what the way things happen in developing countries because you don't get to really pay for most of these vaccinations or it's very subsidized. So um, it takes time before it seeps down to those um, low resource countries. Um, and uh, I think that is what happened because even in the US, uh, like a decade ago, there were still different you know, fashions, you know, because people are not very, they didn't receive HPV vaccination initially, even here. Um, in the past, like um, 10 years, there are still a lot of, you know, like, oh, some, some parents think, it's a free check for their kids to be having sex, like sex anyhow. Once mm-hmm. they get, once they get the vaccine, they believe oh, they can, they just, they can just run amok with uh, doing whatever they like, like protection that is confusing for them. They don't want to do that for their kids. So a lot of mi- misconception about um, uh, HPV vaccine, but it, right now they are so it is well received. Um, I can say now. Most times for the adolescent, even in clinic, we just tell them, oh, you are 11 years. So um, so they are so for the vaccination. So let's not go into the vaccination proper. Okay. So there are standards. Um, so you get the first. So for the HPV vaccine, do we use the Gardasil now? Or maybe there are other forms that other people use elsewhere. It's HPV 9. And by 9, it just means, I think the initial one was just HPV 4, which has four serotypes. Like I told you, there are lots of serotypes. So HPV 9 like has nine stuffs in the concussion. So that means you get the, the vaccine does not protect you against all strains, but the most important strains are included in the vaccines. So you get it. So usually at nine at 11, so the standard, the first dose at 11 years. So between okay. 11 and 12, you get the first dose. Mm. And you get a second dose between six to 12 months after the first dose, right? So if you are able to get those two doses before you turn 15 years, it's just two doses. One, first one at 11 or 12, yeah. anytime, or even 13 or even 14 and the second one six months after. But once you clock 15, mm. it will be three doses. Okay. So from 15, it will be three doses, and it's still good. So it will be three doses once you're 15. But if before 15, it will be two doses. And for three doses, it's one um, at um, one start, maybe let's say you're 15, let's say it will be, Toby just came from Nigeria and she was 16 and like, oh, there's something called HPV vaccination. Oh, I think I need to get this. So they give you at start, at that 16, then a month after, they give you the second one. And six months after the first one, which is like five months after the second one, you get the third one. Um, So that's how they do it. And now um, they've actually expanded the coverage from 15 to 45. So anybody within that bracket of, if you are no more than 45 years, you can get HPV vaccine. And you get three doses because you're already past 15. So you get three doses. So, um, you know, if you're listening here and um, you're less than 45 and you've not been vaccinated against, um, you know, human puppy or uh, uh, virus, yeah, you sure can get it. Talk to your um, primary care provider and they would um, give it to you at no cost to you, maybe to your <laughs> insurance will cover it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, so um, Dr. Adela, before you go on very quickly, I have a question regarding this HP vaccine. So is it just... In, I know some, some people might be confused, so I would like you to help us clarify because we're talking about cervical cancer and we're talking about HPV. So are we saying that HPV, only females get HPV or males also get HPV, the, the vaccine? 
Oh, so um, because we're talking of cervical cancer, so this is more tailored to females, but the males are not spared, right? Males can get HPV virus, but because they don't have cervix, so they don't get to get cervical cancer, but they get other forms of cancer. They can get penile um, cancer, like in the penis, they could have crotch. Um, so, um, or they could have um, all these warts that look, you know, all this cauliflower shaped mass and growth around the genital area. It's mm -hmm. also due to HPVs, maybe the non oncogenic strain. Um, mm -hmm. So they also get it. So that is why males are also included in the vaccination. So in the okay. US now, it's not just females, both males and females. Once you are within the age, um, age, age range that can receive it, you get it. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. Yeah. Okay. Oh yeah. So that is um that is that about um HPV vaccination. Um, what else am I supposed to talk about? Um, yeah. What else am I supposed to talk about? Yeah, I think um I I think I think you you already touched on everything. What okay. cervical cancer is? We okay. talked about the age range. We moved to the symptoms. We talked about the um possible causes the types risk factors um screening okay. diagnosis and and all oh, yeah so just to summarize um so um just to summarize so um cervical cancer is definitely um something we want to protect ourselves from getting and um if um, vaccination is sure a way of preventing um you know yourself of you know from I think it's a preventive measure so get vaccinated and um also it's um important to also um comply with the screening recommendation and um this is the uh, the usual um you know uh you know you know people tend to shy away a little bit because it's not convenient. It's kind of invas um, intrusive, you know, mm -hmm. telling somebody to just, you know, open the legs and, you know, dipping something into yeah, like to this. So, you know, based on, you know, some cultural beliefs or religious affiliation or, or stuff, some people are not just comfortable, you know, but of course, yeah, it's, um, it's, um, it's for, your benefit or for our benefit. So it's good to just comply with. And um, this is not just for those that are sexually promiscuous. Even if you are not, HPV can be acquired, you know, even with contact, without even um, actual sexual penetration. It can be um, acquired via, you know, contact or other form of sexual touchings. So that shouldn't be an excuse. Uh, for getting um, mm. the screening done. Um, mm. To date now, there are no like um, superior, I know studies have been done to compare cytologic testing, pap smear and HPV DNA HPV. testing, which mm. one is better. Um, but um, um, different studies are mixed on this, um, like um, a couple of studies, both randomized and, um, you know, uh, prospective studies have said mm. like maybe the HPV testing has higher detection rates um, and um, compared to the pap smear. Pap smear. But um, some other studies, when they did um, aggregate or cumulative studies, after they did the first one, and maybe five years later, they, they took the same cohorts to retest. They found out that there was no difference. So um, I'm just, I want to put that in until something standard comes out. They are both, um, you can go for any of those. Um, yeah, of or you can have a discussion with your primary care provider mm -hmm. Um, or whatever, and um, they would um, give you more information. Um, so, um, yeah, those are the uh, the stuff. Um, um, yeah, if you have any questions, please, um, I'll be happy to answer them. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Adela. Personally, I do not have any more questions at this time. And so to our viewers, to our listeners, if you are listening, uh, via audio. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Today we have um, Dr. Adiola with us and we've talked about cervical cancer. We've touched on different things on cervical cancer and, and as he has noted, it is one of the leading causes 
of um, morbidity and mortality, especially among women. And also it did emphasize the need for screening. It could be pap smear, it could be HPV testing. Yes, and also yes. if you know someone, tell your sister, tell your friends, tell your brothers, everyone about getting the HP vaccine. That's the human papilloma. Virus. Yeah, the, the virus uh, vaccine. We need to get tested um, uh, irrespective of the age. You need to speak with your primary care provider and we just need to help one another. And that's why we're doing this series to promote health education, to bring to our knowledge or our uh, 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 to bring to our awareness things that we might not just think about on a daily basis. And this, uh, things like this, like the can cervical cancer issue is something that is really, really serious. And so wherever you're watching from, if you have questions, if you have feedback, you can drop them on our YouTube channel in the comment section. You can, can drop them on, on WhatsApp. You can drop them on Instagram and anywhere you're listening from or watching. And so thank you so much. And you know how we always do. We do not live without um, without a quote. And so our quote for today is, is, um, is from Ambrose Redmond. And it says that courage is not the absence of fear, but rather judgment that something else is more important than fear. Again, courage is not the absence of fear, but rather judgment that something else is more important than fear. So we need to fight our fears and just go out there, get tested, get screened, get the vaccines, talk to our friends, talk to our, our, our colleagues, our friends, everybody, siblings about all of this. And you might just be saving a life. All right. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Dr. Adela, for coming. And so we have come to the end of today's episode. Enjoy. Bye.